Hi, welcome to Kigali Global Dialogue. This is uh, Bhuvan Bagga and we are uh, live at Kigali right now. And we are looking at Paths to Peace Centering the Development Agenda. I have with me Emmanuel Akwiti, Executive Director, Institute of Democrat Democratic Governance, Ghana. And Lara Sterakian, President, APRI, Armenia, if I got that right. Basically, what we are looking at now is we've seen within our generation how a strong US-led unipolar system is transformed into a multipolar, strongly multipolar system with each region now has its own regional hegemons or regional sheriffs. Each one has its own ideas about how a region should function, how we should uh, shape the issues and agendas in the region. And that, in a way, has opened up many opportunities for the global south, but it also has opened up a lot of competition. So in, we have a lot more uh, fissure and pressure points within countries where new issues are coming up. And, and often what happens with this competition and, and this race for increased influence in the region is a lot of uh, issues like uh, poverty, issues like, uh, like social issues, like issues around water, global warming. Those issues get sidetracked as countries open up new conflicts or new disputes with each other and divert resources and energies. So first, I'll just open it for both my speak both the speakers and both the panelists here to talk about the kind of challenges you've seen or kind of issues you've seen in your region or the areas that you focused on uh, as the world's transformed from a unipolar system to a multipolar. Has it been good? Has it been bad? Maybe you could start with that. I think that's a very intelligent framing, first of all. So this movement toward multipolar, dark regionalism at times. You know, there's, there's great things about regionalism, but also dark things. This not just competition for resources, but a net de destabilization, frankly, because old governance models, old peace building models, all kinds of conflict, revolu re conflict, conflict revolution and conflict resolution, you could say, uh, everything that was kept in check by the previous rules is now uh, in dynamic flux. And that's not good for a lot of countries. And you do lose a lot of the development momentum. As soon as that destabilization kicks in and you see renewed conflict and uh, competition, bad things start to happen. And that is very dangerous for the individuals, for the citizens and residents of those regions. Uh, to build on what my colleague has said, I see clearly that um, in COVID times, uh, the world moved towards some solidarity, passion, collective action to deal with a pandemic that threatened us as humans and so on. But since then, we've seen different things happening. Um, as my colleague said, in the individual countries, particularly in Africa, um, you know, things are not going so well. Um, first of all, uh, you need to look at the youth generation, um, which is probably the majority. Of, of, of what Africa has, and is becoming difficult. They are the most educated. These are, we are more university graduates uh, who are unemployed. Uh, they used to have opportunities for going abroad to look for greener pastures. That door appears shut, and the countries themselves haven't built systems that enables these youth groups to engage in the policy processes and influence whatever. Uh, they could influence and their priorities defined. And so you have a very difficult situation where most of the governments, are, the economies are very weak. Uh, they are not creating more jobs and there are huge debts that need to be tackled. And so from the assurances we got that the world would stand up, you know, Africa was one of the countries that got a lot of aid. Uh, vaccines came from all over India and various other countries. Um, there isn't that collective focus on helping the weak and the needy anymore. I think we did not have war in, in Ukraine and Russia, and I wondered if there was war. How then could, for instance, uh, America, uh, Russia sell its drugs to various European countries, Sputnik and all that? And now it's a more difficult situation because most African countries don't know whom to turn to to get the aid they need. The Americans are quite busy, but they're also talking about their priorities different. They want to see democracy stabilized because they think Chinese, China and Russia uh, seem to be pursuing authoritarian models in the context. So there is some kind of competing uh, priorities, and that, I think, is leaving the situation or Africa in a dire situation uh, in terms of being able to recover fully economically 
uh, from, and then also being able to address the needs of the majority population, the youth with aspirations. You, you mentioned, you uh, just mentioned in passing the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict that we have right now, the war. Um, we had India, uh, India hosted the G20 foreign ministers meeting earlier this year, and then earlier this week we had a G20 development ministers meeting. And in both instances, we've seen uh, the, min the ministers not reaching a kind of joint, conclu joint conclusion, a joint statement, as you would say. And, and the issues around uh, poverty, around climate change, and uh, some of the issues around energy and food security, the issues on technology transfer, the issues that actually matter a lot to Global South. And for many of them, these are more pressing than maybe what's happening for them. Many in Asia and Africa see the conflict in Russia as a distant conflict, which maybe does not hit them as close as some of these issues. How do you think with, with multilateral, global multilateral systems, even the likes of G20, which is the 20 biggest and the most powerful economies of the, of the world, failing to get moving, get their act together on some of these pressing issues, what exactly is the recourse for, for some of the weaker countries or some of these regions which, are, which have traditionally been on the margins of power center? I think it's not just the global south and not just those countries left out of the G20. It's every individual human life on the ground that has an urgent basic development need, whether it's in public health, food security, and they, that when they see that there is a global leadership that is so polarized they can't come together and find solutions, it bodes horribly for their well-being. Uh, I have covered conflict zones as a journalist for most of my career. Now I, I'm at the Applied Policy Research Center in Armenia. And so what we see through that lens is that there has to be a forward momentum on public health, whether it's the vaccine drives against polio in Syria or food insecurity and starvation in Venezuela or in Yemen. We are seeing these geopolitical rifts have severe human consequences. And those are much harder to solve when you don't have any sort of global leadership to move those things forward. And yes, I do think that if your child is starving in Yemen, you don't particularly understand why all of these leaders can't find a way around their disagreements and just deliver what's needed on the ground. So those urgent developmental needs, those basic human needs are, are quite urgent. And they are not, it's not just a matter of the urgency of it. It is it's the fact that um, the impact of COVID 19 on developing countries was devastating. Um, many people, factories or the industrial sector is almost collapsed. Trade has been difficult and um, you have quite a lot of layoffs. Uh, governments have borrowed so much, <laughs> they can't meet the obligations. Ghana has just uh, had an IMF bailout after waiting for about six months and with a lot of negotiations. So I think the economic post uh, COVID, the economic situation in Africa is dire. Uh, not even in South Africa, which is the industrialized, most industrialized economy. Nigeria has its own challenges, Egypt as well. These are the big, three big economies and so on. And, and they owe China so much that even now, trying to go to the I, IFIs for assistance, China has to agree because China does bilateral aid or loans and huge amounts of loans whereas the world looks at the multilateral institutions to do this. And so it's a very complex problem. And I think what it's creating is, is creating an army of graduates, highly educated people, unemployed. Uh, in Ghana, for instance, we have Unemployed Graduates Association and tells you the story. Yet we haven't recovered from the economy. We owe so much. Uh, inflation is high, the economic consequences of the COVID and the international support that came are now sort of divergent. So um, it's causing a lot of problems. There are some who are calling even for end of democracy. In our country, we have a history of coups, but so is it in other countries that the youth now want some solutions to their problems. They no longer can go to Europe, migration and crossing you know, the ocean and all that has changed. And so some problem has to be solved within, fixed. And I think that is where I think dialogue between the generations are important. The democratic values are real. The youth votes, they are the majority voters. And they are also the ones who are the next generation of leaders. And I think these dialogues are important. Education, 
is there, but what is education when after you've gained all the qualifications, you don't find a job and you can't travel as well to other places where you could be. This, so is, what the this is what the Sustainable Development Goals were supposed to be about, yeah. that dignified work, those opportunities that you're talking about. And if we take our eyes so far off the ball that we can't follow through, then of course people are going to feel very disappointed, betrayed, and that's going to lead to upheaval of all kinds, yeah. very destabilizing. One thing I don't want, want to pick up from what you said, uh, right now you mentioned three big countries in Africa which have relatively better off economically. In, in, in Asia generally and South Asia in particular, where I'm a journalist, uh, I see a lot of competition now between India and China and to an extent India plus Japan and China when it comes to regional investments, when it comes to investing in projects. And in, in some cases, some of these investments have also led to bad debts like we've seen, we've seen in some of the countries in, in, in South Asia and, and challenges of what happens to the economy going forward when the countries are not able to return the, the, the debt, that, that loans that they've taken. How, how exactly in your respective regions, since in the absence of uh, a big overall kind of global power, uh, withdrawal of the US in some senses from some of the regions, uh, because some of the regions from because of what's happening, has have some of the regional players taken taken a step forward in terms of competition? Has there been a kind of a geopolitical competition between them when it comes to extending their influence in, in some of these regions with investments and kind of filling the vacuum? How exactly have you seen that play out? Zambia is one case. Um, Ghana, almost every country, Kenya, it's, it's a very serious situation. These are millions so on. And that uh, situation has also put these countries in great difficulty in securing uh, debt relief or uh, loans or grants from, from the IMF, borrowing from the IMF, because the amounts they owe China require that China is at the table. But China didn't want to play a multilateral game. It says the loans were bilateral. <laughs> so it wanted to negotiate individually. And that protracted the negotiation period. Although eventually it came back to the table with the multilaterals and so on and so forth. So um, it's not time. It, we are not in a situation where we're seeing a lot of foreign investments, creating jobs, transforming agriculture, and so on. There is some stagnation. There is some desperation as well uh, across all the countries. So I think that the post-COVID uh, situation is dire. We need a new order. I, I don't know how it's going to come about, but the more challenging thing is that you also have a situation where there's a challenge between authoritarian systems and then establishing liberal democracy, uh, democracies or defending them. So that in West Africa, the U.S. is looking more at uh, how to stop uh, democratic uh, regression or something recession. We also have the jihadists from the north also taking over countries. Ghana, for instance, is surrounded by three countries that already have had coup d'etats. And then you go south and east to you find francophone countries with jihadist pressures. So it is the center of security <laughs> holding itself a small country and its vast amount of resources needed. But it's, it's, they are not getting what they need. But on security, the West is coming somehow under an Accra security initiative, or Accra initiative, they call it. But they are more minded about how do you keep the youth from crossing the seas, or how do you deal with piracy or pirates on the seas, and how do you ensure that the jihadists do not take over West Africa? So it's, it's a very serious situation. Unemployment, security risk, no money. And before you before you get on to answering this, just to add to this, in in uh, several South Asia in the South Asian region and in in Asian countries, we've seen uh, digital uh, media, the social media, play a lot, play a significant, play a major role in in uh, everyday life in the sense that often issues, the key issues of development, etc., get sidetracked with geopolitics and other issues. So, how do you see social media being a force or being a kind of a pivot actor in this entire in, in this entire issue when it when it comes to keeping the issues around development or the key base Basic issues, basic basic human issues at the center of debates and discussions in the policy making circles and also in the governance circles. I have to say we have a very different picture in Armenia. I think we've seen social media play a rather positive role in keeping vital development issues on the agenda. You have a very strong women's movement, very strong calls for sustainable development. In our case, it's a slightly different picture. It's been a very turbulent region. 
both in terms of the conflict in the South Caucasus and the fallout of the Russia-Ukraine war. But separately to that, in Armenia, we've had 12.6% economic growth last year. It's actually a boom time alongside this geopolitical turmoil. It's very strange to live through, but you're seeing a lot of momentum. That investment competition is starting to kick up between great powers, but you see a lot of diaspora investment, the construction boom, but also a heavy, heavy drive toward green renewable energy transition, agricultural revolution. There's a lot of gains to be made in sustainable agriculture. So possibly because the country was starting from such a low baseline in certain fields, but you're seeing that tremendous growth curve and you're also seeing a lot in the IT sector. It's a landlocked country, but more than a few tech unicorns, billion dollar tech companies. So something is going right with those sorts of sustainable economic development drives, even despite the geopolitical turmoil, how that becomes uh, really ingrained and continues on. We might have been, frankly, a, a few beats behind Africa in terms of investment from major global players. So now we're seeing that start to compete for investments in infrastructure, et cetera. But as, as the country or, or the region makes over 10 per double digit growth rate, has, has the country been able to, I mean, what exactly do you think the country has done? Has it been able to separate politics from the econ economics, everyday economics, or what exactly has it happened according to you? Well, it, it, some things have worked in Armenia's favor. It's an open society, it's a free society, it's a nice place to live. So you have seen in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war, many companies, IT, tech firms, tech talent, move to Armenia. That's been a major driver of growth. But also, again, the country was still coming out of uh, not just the post-Soviet hangover, but bloodless, very happy revolution, pro-democracy revolution in 2018. So that unleashed the transition from the post-Soviet era into this very pro-democracy era actually unleashed a lot of innovation, talent coming home, investment, uh, broke, broke up a lot of monopolies and oligopolies. So I think Armenia is still enjoying actually the upside of some of its politics, even despite a lot of the geopolitical uh, rocky shoals and, and turbulent waters that it has to go through. So in, 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 in India, uh, a couple of years back in the last we saw Indian government try to push major agricultural reforms. I mean, India's agriculture sector is, is grossly over dependent on manpower and it's like outdated in its systems. The entire reform, which most economists and most most agricultural special, agriculture specialists think is like the right way forward, could not get through as, as thousands and thousands of farmers kind of came out on the streets and protested against the government. The government, which is like a majority government, had to roll them roll it back. Is there is there something? Uh, I mean, do you think for regions like the relatively poorer regions like Asia and and in Africa and and some of the other parts, how exactly can the gov governments ensure that there is a kind of a some sort of wall between economics and, and politics or or can the can good economics also be good politics maybe in a, in in a minute if you could talk about that well i i think that the african situation is the friend there was an investment boom when the chinese uh, loans were flowing in uh, but now with covid and most of the time world trade being difficult for many countries you have a situation where the debt situation is quite serious. The Ukrainian-Russian war affected many African countries. Um, you know, food, many dependent on food, uh, agricultural imports. And that affected them. Uh, education, various other bills have cropped up. But I also think the African countries have themselves to, to borrow because in good times, they borrowed very heavily uh, from uh, the, the bonds markets. And now when they couldn't meet the obligations, well, you can write off uh, loans or delay payment if it's from the IMF or World Bank, but you can't do that easily on the private market. So they've been, they've been rated down and so on. So uh, the buoyant optimism or the, the kind of uh, blessings that have attended Armenia and so on is not particularly the case in most of Africa. From COVID to the current situation, it's really getting bad every time so maybe in the final few seconds maybe i could just sum what i tried what i understood from what you said essentially lara mentioned about dark regionalism so to say and how the entire earlier world order so to say is now in a flux a lot of things that we took for granted systems that we took for granted they have changed and and uh, going forward of course uh, armenia may be an exception when it comes to being 
insulated, so to say, from geopolitics. But a lot of other regions will have to confront geopolitics first or maybe address some of the geopolitical challenges that come with multipolarity. And while they somehow also manage to look at uh, the key development issues, which will have to go hand in hand. Don't get me wrong. Geopolitical stability will help economic growth in Armenia tremendously. I just think we've seen that you can still have some of that upside. Good stewards in those economies taking certain fields forward despite it all. Nothing to disagree there. Yes, and in the case of Africa, I think the geopolitical politics is hurting the economy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So this is live at Kakali. And thank you to both the speakers with me.